Mrs. Jones was known to be the sweetest lady in her church. Uh, she was one of the oldest members of her church, and no one had ever heard Mrs. Jones say anything bad about anybody. And there were two young fellows that were talking about that, and one said, uh, I think I can get Ms. Jones to say something bad about someone. And the other guy said, nah, you'll never do it. Ms. Jones has never said anything bad about anybody. You can't make her do it. He said, you just watch me. And so uh, they took off to find Ms. Jones. And when they found her, this first fella that was so confident said, Ms. Jones, what do you think about the devil? And she thought for a minute, he, he, he thought sure that she was going to say something bad about the devil. And so Ms. Jones thought for just a minute, and then she said, well, he is rather consistent and persistent. And he is. He's not going to leave you alone. He's always scheming against God's church and against God's people. And when Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, he made that point. Listen to what he said in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. Paul writes, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now Paul goes on in this passage, in, later in this chapter, to explain the full armor of God. And you uh, know, you've heard sermons on that. I've preached series on that. Uh, our Vacation Bible School theme centered around the armor of God this year. Remember the belt of truth? the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. And these are elements to the armor of God. And it's so important if you're going to take your stand against the devil's schemes that you have on the full armor of God. Each part of that armor is important for your success in standing firm against the devil. But I'm not going to talk to you today about the armor of God. What I want to focus on is the schemes of the devil. Because so often I think we fail to understand how the devil operates. And therefore he's able to use his scheming to attack us where we're most vulnerable. You see, it's important to have on that spiritual armor. But it's important to understand how the devil will attack you, attack the Lord's church. What are these schemes that the devil uses when he comes against God's people? I want uh, you to know that Satan is the enemy of God. And therefore, he is the enemy of God's church. And therefore, he is the enemy of God's people. So as our enemy, he's always scheming against us. Because he knows if he can affect God's people, he will affect God's church, and he will affect God. Now, he's not going to be able to have much luck if he confronts God directly. He knows that. And so what he will do is he'll scheme against the weakest link. That's you and me. If he can affect our lives, if he can affect our faith, that will impact the church and it will impact the Lord's work. As Christians, we gather as a church, the body of Christ, and we become a real threat to Satan when we come together to worship to pray, to teach, to serve, to encourage one another. We are standing for the Lord and against the devil. And it's apparent 
that he will do everything he can to prevent that from happening. He schemes against us to keep us from fulfilling God's purpose for us. And when we are unaware of the devil's schemes, then we're more vulnerable to them. And he is more successful in using them against us. Now the observation that Mrs. Jones had about the devil is certainly true. He is consistent. And he is persistent. He basically does the same thing over and over and over again. He uses the same schemes against the church. And he doesn't stop with one church. He'll go from church to church to church. From believer to believer to believer. And he's done that through the ages. We need to be aware of his schemes so that we can stand firm against them. Now, the devil has a lot of ways that he schemes against us. This morning, we're just going to focus on three. I think these are some of the most common and some of the areas that he seems to use uh, most successfully against God's people. They are doubt and discouragement and division. Sowing doubt has been one of the enemy's weapons from the very beginning of time. You remember back in the Garden of Eden? The Lord told Adam in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you, do must, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from this tree, you will certainly die. No doubts about what the Lord wanted him to understand, was it? He said, don't eat from this tree. There will be consequences. Now, Adam didn't understand the full consequence. He didn't understand spiritual death, the separation from God that would affect all of eternity, all of us. But Adam understood, I can't eat from that tree. That's what God said. But later in Genesis chapter 3, let's see what happened. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. And so he said to the woman that came on in the interim here, Here's what God said, or excuse me, what the devil said to Eve. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from any of the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. Now listen. Listen. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now do you see what he did? You see how the devil schemed against Eve? The devil stirred up doubt in her heart and in her mind. And the result was she sinned against God. She did what God told her not to do. And she caused Adam, her husband, to doubt God's word by asking the question, did God really say this? You can almost hear the voice of the serpents whispering in her ear. Did God really say that? 
Can you really trust what God said to you? He's just trying to keep something good from you. The devil is still using that tactic today. And I would suppose that everybody in this room and everybody who is watching online right now has heard that whisper in your ear. Did God really say you shouldn't do that? Is it really that bad for you to do that? Think of the joy that you can receive. God won't care. Did God really tell you? You see, his scheme is to try to get you to doubt the word of God. Doubt was the weapon that Satan used against Jesus himself when he tried to tempt him in the wilderness. Every temptation that the devil used was preceded by this word, if. If you are the Son of God, the enemy whispered to Jesus. He was trying to get Jesus to doubt his own divinity. And he's still using this tactic of doubt today. Doubt can come in many forms. Sometimes it's a direct frontal attack on the truth of God's Word. We, we see it happening in our society and in our culture today. God's Word is under attack. There are many in church who simply, have, who simply don't believe that everything in God's Word are true. These are people in the church. The devil has effectively affected us. Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Many of God's people have fallen to doubt. Or, or at least they live their lives like they don't believe everything in the Word. The devil is right there encouraging you to doubt what God clearly says in his word. Doubt is also raised as to the very nature of God. You know, as we live real life, we talk about that from time to time what real life means for us. And real life is hard. Uh, we come up against uh, difficult decisions and, and tragedies strike and, and things happen that we have no control over. And sometimes even Christians find themselves doubting the love and the mercy of God. How could a loving God cause this to happen or allow this to happen? Why would such a thing like this happen if God really loved us? And the enemy's right there, whispering in your ear, trying to get you to question the goodness, the grace of God in your life. Doubt comes to the individual believer regarding their position in Christ. The enemy is continually working that angle as well. What he's trying to do is to drive a wedge between you and the Lord. And if he can create just a moment of doubt in your heart as to God's love for you, then he's gained an inroad that's going to lead to further doubt. And you'll soon be sitting out there in the world saying, God never loved me anyway. 
We've seen it happen. We know it does. The devil doesn't have the power to actually separate you from the Lord and from his love for you. But he tries to instill that element of doubt in your heart so that then you end up separating yourself from God's love. Of course, the best way to counter what he's trying to do is what Jesus did. Every time the devil tried to tip Jesus, he came back with the truth of God's word. When the devil said, if you really are the Son of God, and Jesus said, the word tells me this, I don't doubt God's word. And so when he tries to get you to doubt your worth in Christ, you can tell him, according to God's word, I am a child of God. You can tell him, according to John 15, 15, I am God's friend. According to Romans 5, 1, I have been justified in Christ. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 17, I am united with the Lord. According to 1 Corinthians 6, 20, I have been bought with a price, and I now belong to God. According to Ephesians 1, 1, I am a saint of the Lord. Listen, you, you hear what I'm telling you? When the devil tries to put doubt in your heart, you need to respond to him boldly by claiming the truth of God's word. In Ephesians 1.5, I've been adopted as God's child. Ephesians 2.18, I have direct access to God through his Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.14, I have been redeemed and I have been forgiven of all my sins. Colossians 2.10, I am made complete in Christ. Don't you let the devil put doubt in your heart as to God's love for you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And your worth and your standing before the Lord is not determined by the devil. It's determined by God's Son. Don't doubt that. There's another common scheme that the devil uses. And that's discouragement. And there are many faithful Christians who find themselves blindsided by discouragement. I mean, life is good. Everything's going along fine. We got all these blessings. And then something happens that you didn't expect. Circumstances take over. You find yourself in that situation where you're having a down day. When, when things are just going rough, when real life sets in, when things don't go according to plan, and suddenly you find yourself slipping off into discouragement, and sometimes despair. A few words of criticism here. Someone treating you badly at work. Somebody in your family saying some harsh things to you. Things happening at church that you don't understand. Many great men and women of God have had severe uh, bouts with discouragement and depression. And perhaps the clearest example of that is Elijah, who won a great victory over the prophets of Baal. But after that victory, Queen Jezebel ordered his execution, all things. You can read about it in 1 Kings. Listen to what uh, 1 Kings 19, uh, 3 and 4 tell us about what happened next. Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. 
And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, and he sat down under it, and he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Go ahead and take my life. I'm no better than anybody else. Now, that's some pretty serious discouragement from one of the greatest men of God. It took a, the intervention of the Lord himself to bring Elijah out of that mood of discouragement. If you think that you can avoid being discouraged from time to time, then look at what happened to Elijah. Now you may not have been sitting under a broom tree with a desire to die, but I dare say that everybody in this room and everybody who's watching online right now has had moments when you are discouraged. When you feel defeated. When you don't know how you're going to do what you got to do next. And that's where God's church comes in. That's why it's so important to be a part of the family of God. God has instructed his church to encourage one another. Listen to what he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Therefore, encourage one another. He's talking about believers. Encourage one another. And build each other up. Just like, in fact, you're doing now. That's why the church is so important. Because we all face real life and we need one another so that we can encourage one another. Then uh, the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 3, verse 13, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. There's the schemes of the devil. He, he's a hard at work trying to discourage you. And you need to be with your family in church. And you need to conscientiously make the effort to encourage those around you as they encourage you. You know where this sin's deceitfulness comes from? That's the scheme of the devil to get you discouraged. And the church should be a place of support and encouragement so that the devil's scheme will not succeed. There's one more I want to share with you this morning. There's a lot more ways that the devil attacks us. But this next one, I just I wanted to share just a few. My time's about gone already. But another scheme of the devil is division. One of the most effective strategies that Satan has to bring about division in the body of Christ. That's one of the things he tries to do and often is most successful in doing. It makes sense that the devil would try to create division in the body of Christ since the Lord desires the exact opposite of that. It's the Lord's desire that his body be united. And so the devil, if he can work his way in and cause some division in the church, he has succeeded in his efforts to thwart the work of God. A strong, united church is a testimony to the world of the love of God. And Satan will do whatever he can to destroy that testimony. Now, let's bring this down to a personal level. Ever since this COVID crisis began some 18 months ago, 
I've been warning this church of the dangers of division. It's a scheme of the devil. And he's going to push it as hard as he can. Those who thought that masks were important. Those who didn't think they were necessary. Those who got the vaccine. Those who would never get that shot in their arm. Those who believed that social distancing was important. Those that thought they needed a hug. Those that thought that uh, our services should come back sooner than they did. Against those who thought we never should have stopped in the first place. Those who came back and those that still aren't here. Now through all of this, we've held together well. In spite of those differences. But the devil has not surrendered. And he's not given up. And he's still on the prowl. And he's still trying to find some way that he can cause division in God's church. So let me remind you again. We cannot and we must not allow divisions or strife to enter into our church over the issues of COVID. The devil is still scheming. And he's going to try to use that against us. And so we must continue to be resolved to not let him succeed. Now, I mentioned earlier, we've made difficult decisions in the last 24, I really last 12 hours. And there was a lot of back and forth among the staff members, and me with the deacons, and we tried to get people's ideas. And, and I'll just tell you, I, I'm not sure that everybody agreed with the steps that we took. But we cannot allow something like this to cause d division or strife in our church. That is a scheme of the devil. And we must continue to stay focused on Christ and make the best decisions we can with the information we have at that moment. And if we'll continue to do that, and if we'll continue to be united, then we'll get through this stuff. This mess one day hopefully will be behind us. But until it is, we've got to hang together. We've got to fight against the schemes of the devil. Doubt. Discouragement. Division. These are among the schemes that the devil uses against the Lord's church and against the Lord's people. So be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to be here in your presence. And even though there are many who are at home today watching online, you have joined our hearts together in one purpose, and that is to worship you and to proclaim to this world that we are one body in Christ, that we believe his word, and that we live by his word, and we make our decisions based on what his word teaches us. Help us to be aware of the devil's schemes to create doubt or discouragement or division among us so that together we can get through these issues of real life that we're facing just now. Thank you for being the God that you are. Thanking, thank you for touching our lives the way you do. 
Lead us now, Father, in these moments of decision and dedication. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I, I could never close a service without giving you the opportunity to spend a few moments with the Lord. Might be down here at this altar. There may be some decision I can pray with you about. But uh, this is a moment that sometimes God is at work in a person's life, and I don't know that. I certainly don't want to be the one who prevents you from the opportunity to express what God is doing in your life. And so we're going to have another song now to give you that opportunity. You can come and pray at the altar. I'll be glad to pray with you if I can help you some way. But you respond as we sing this song. If you're watching online, you respond right there at home. And you can give me a call later, and we'll pray together about whatever, whatever the issue is that you're trying to get settled. You respond if the Lord is speaking to you. Let's stand and sing.
Amen. Lead me to the cross. Well, I certainly am glad that you uh, came today to be with us here in the sanctuary and for all those who are watching online. And uh, let me just remind you that uh, this will conclude our activities at the church today. We're not going to have Sunday school or the other uh, 11 o'clock service. And again, it's an effort to uh, minimize contact in the spread of uh, this COVID in our church. Uh, Dennis Bazin taught me an important lesson uh, years ago. And uh, he said, you got to do everything you can to keep that from happening, whatever that is. Uh, that crack in the cement that needs to be fixed or, or that broken chair that somebody can sit in and fall down. He said, you got to do what you can to keep things from happening. And so I think that that principle applies uh, for our situation just now. We're, we're making an effort to keep uh, the spread of the COVID uh, from taking place. And so uh, we trust that the Lord is going to help us in that effort. Uh, if, if you need something this week, be sure and let us know. Uh, we will be here at the church. The office will be open. And so uh, we'll certainly try to minister to you uh, if there's a way that we can do that. Let me lead us in a word of prayer as we're dismissed. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for the, another opportunity to join our hearts together in worship and uh, in the study of your word. And I pray, Father, that you'll be with us as we go out from this place that you'll help us to uh, combat the, the uh, efforts of the devil uh, to separate us from your love and to give us uh, doubt that you uh, do have your, our best interest in your heart. Uh, help us to be uh, faithful and help us to stay focused on Jesus. Uh, we ask these things in his name. Amen.